helpful to play it through one time.
86, How Great Thou Art. And we're going to sing the third stanza of number 86, How Great Thou Art. see you all here on this beautiful Sabbath day. Let's all <clears throat> clear our minds and open our hearts and then enjoy the fellowship we have here this morning. You know, sing our opening song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, 506. Let's stand as we sing number 506. <laughs>
Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Is there any prayer requests? No, we want to remember Melora. Melora, okay. How's she doing? Any better? I don't see you. Oh, there he is. How's Valora? Okay, good. There was another surgery. Marcy Hayes. Marcy Hayes. Marcy Hayes, Richard's daughter. So remember her as well. I understand she went through the surgery well. I don't know if there's been any. Any progress? Any updates with Marcy Hayes, Richard? Any? Okay. Norm? Um, also, Peyton leaves Sunday, I believe. No, he's not going to leave. He leaves Monday. He leaves Wednesday. Okay, so leaves and went. So this week coming out of the way, he's leaving. All right, let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you so much for another Sabbath. Thank you for the opportunity to gather here among a country where we're not at a physical war. Uh, we know there's a spiritual war going on in this country and around the world that, uh, unfortunately, we may not see, but we do feel the the wages of it. Uh, we ask that you continue to guide us, especially during service. Keep our minds clear, Lord, and focused on you. Keep the distractions of this world far, far away, Lord. We ask you to be with all the people that are need extra prayer, Lord, uh, going through surgeries or health issues or just own personal struggles, Lord. We ask you to lift them up, um, bring people into their lives to show your glory and reflect your love to them. Uh, we just thank you so much for the spring weather. We see all the birds and the bees coming around, and we just know that as beautiful and well-keeping as they are, are, Lord, that we are more than they are. Uh, we know that you care for us more than all those little creatures, Lord, and we just thank you so much. Um, we just ask you to be with the pastor, or whoever's doing the sermon today, Lord. Uh, guide their words, allow them to be of yours. And uh, we just thank you so much for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll have the mission spotlight now. John was a bright young student in Malawi. As a teenager, he was handpicked by local leaders of his faith tradition to study at a school in Zanzibar, Tanzania. The goal was for him to learn how to go into unentered areas and create new followers. During his time there, he learned a lot about his own religion, and the next step was for him to also learn about Christianity, since he would be interacting with Christians regularly. After three years, they said you go back home and you research the King James Vision, this one. You go there for that one, special for the King James Vision. Why King James Vision? because they do believe that the King James Vision have got a good explanation than the other vision. John enrolled at an Adventist school and joined a youth group. He attended all the classes and engaged with pastors in discussions about Adventist beliefs. All the while, he was sending reports back to the religious leaders in Zanzibar. Eventually, after three years studying at Rwaz Mission, the Seventh Adventist Mission, this way now I come to say, ah, I do understand the Bible. John felt convicted to give his life to God and was baptized at a camp meeting. After his baptism, he stopped sending reports to Zanzibar. John's father was furious. My father, to him, is with an ambition that I'm going to, I, 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 I was to go to Zanzibar, and when I come back from there, they respect me. So to him, it was a privilege that, oh, my, 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 my son now has gone higher. So when he heard that he, I, I have converted into Christianity and now I have been baptized into Seventh-day Adventist, to him it was, came like a blow. But despite rejection from his family, John continued to pursue ministry. Eventually, he was chosen to be a global mission pioneer. So they picked me to put him into global mission pioneer. Can you see now, to go into an entered area. So can you see, the first mission wanted me to go and enter the areas. They, they, they had the same idea, but just intended to go to Seventh Adventist and be a global mission of pioneer. He ministered for 10 years as a pioneer, following Christ's method and sharing his testimony with people he met. John hadn't finished his education yet, so he enrolled at Malawi Adventist University. I wanted to pursue my 
degree, graduated in 2018, 2018. So I appreciate God, I thank God because I'm now a graduate and now I know many things than before. From his teenage years to his time at the university, John knows firsthand the difference Adventist mission schools make in people's lives. This quarter, a portion of the 13th Sabbath offering will go to help build a community outreach and leadership development center on the campus of Malawi Adventist University. Please pray for those involved as the project develops. Pray that more students like John will come to know Jesus through Adventist education. Thank you for supporting mission through 13 Sabbath offering projects like this. William H. and Nora Anderson were leading pioneers of Adventist mission to Southern Africa. They blazed the trail for an expanding mission throughout the southern part of the continent. After ministering and establishing work in several countries, Nora succumbed to Blackwater fever and died in South Africa. Several years later, William got remarried to Mary Elizabeth Perrin. The couple served in Angola from 1924 to 1933. William used his experience and position as superintendent of the Angola Union Mission to advance the gospel message over those nine years. The Andersons scouted future sites where they could establish mission institutions. The work was too much for just them, so other missionaries came to Angola to support the spread of the Advent message. New mission stations were established in the eastern part of the country. The Lukusi and Luz missions were opened. They offered services such as medical care and education. Through Christ's method of ministry, many people came to know the Adventist message. Today, there are more than half a million Seventh-day Adventists in Angola. Statistically, one out of every 59 people is an Adventist. One of these people is Joel. Over the course of his life, Joel explored the teachings of several Christian denominations. He had a lot of questions and never felt fully convicted by any of the teachings, but eventually settled into a congregation. I had a problem with my car. It was missing a part. So, I had a friend from Shakati, who was an elder of the Adventist Church. And I went there and asked him, find me a man that has that part. And he did it. Joel's friend asked him to join him at church the next Sabbath. After Sabbath school and the sermon, Joel was given a book that answered a lot of his questions about God. The Great Controversy. I read, read, read. Then he showed up and brought me some booklets. I read, read, absorbed it all. And then I started distributing them to the others. After reading everything he could get his hands on, Joel decided he wanted to follow Adventist principles. He took what he learned back to his church, where the whole congregation accepted the message. Today, they worship every Sabbath and continue to study God's Word. The Adventist message is spreading in Angola through various means, but there are real needs here. This quarter, a portion of the 13th Sabbath offering will help with four projects in Angola, from building a church and an elementary school at one location to a domestic violence and counseling center at another. Your offerings will help minister to those in need. Please support this offering so more people in Angola will come to know the love of Jesus. Good morning again. I ran across a couple of um, stories this week that just impressed me and I, I wanted to share them. 
Um, first one is about an autistic a boy, family with an autistic boy um, and the difficulties they have communicating with him. Um, there's been a, a lady my age visiting the church um, three or four times. She's been in the lower divisions. Uh, she's got a six to eight year old um, young man with her, I'm going to guess like grandson. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know her name, don't know the situation. I've seen her uh, struggle, try to get him um, to f sit quietly or she's almost, I've seen her wrestling with him down the hallways. Um, he's, and one time he got away from her and went running down the hall and um, she wasn't going to catch up with him. I happened to be in front and saw what was happening and slowed him down. But the, um, the story I'm going to share here enlightened me on the struggle that people have communicating with the autistic. My oldest son is 12 years old and severely autistic. Imagine someone bound by OCD that cannot talk and cannot understand seemingly very simple concepts. He can understand some things, but the concept of abstract communication eludes him. I can tell him to get dressed, but he cannot understand that the tag on a shirt goes behind his neck. So there's a 25% chance that his shirt is on correctly, 25% chance it's on backwards, 25% chance it's on facing correctly but inside out, and 25% chance it's on backwards and inside out. And of course, if it's cold outside, there's a 50% chance he'll come out in shorts. That really is, isn't too big a deal, but the inability to grasp this portion of communication bleeds into everything. Things 99% of people take completely for granted. When he was three years old, he had an ear infection. We didn't know that, of course. We just knew that he was inconsolable and in pain from something. He does not understand questions like, does it hurt here? Or show me where it hurts. Or does your stomach hurt? Does your ear hurt? Does your head hurt? Eventually, his eardrum burst and yellow stuff came out. And we said, oh dear, an ear infection. He's never been given an aspirin for a headache. He probably has had a headache but doesn't know and can't express. He can't tell us of any thing that's bothering him, any ache or pain. He can use the toilet, but doesn't really get using toilet paper. Or maybe he does, but saw us get upset when an entire roll wound up in the toilet. So lately, he trips to the bathroom at 5 a.m., then finds anything to clean up with, whether it's clothes, sheets, towels, something. We've pretty much run the washing machine on sanitize about three quarters, 75 times a week the last two weeks. He's got a reason for it that only he knows. That makes sense to him, but he can't tell us what it is. And we can't get him to figure out to come and get us when he's been to the bathroom. We've taken to hiding foods he prefers giving free reign to potato chips or hummus or cranberries or whatever. He'll eat and eat and eat and then throw up later that night. It's not his fault. He's been on antipsychotics for a few years now. One side effect of which is weight gain. I hate, hate giving him antipsychotics 
but not quite as much as how he acts or acted when he wasn't on them. As a family, we cannot realistically travel. Interruptions to his routine result in a constant moan, whine, crying, outburst of self-injury or rarely attacking others. The pain and fear he feels is very real to him and we are powerless to provide him comfort. Instead, my wife will travel with my other sons while I stay home with him. He has never had a friend that was not a direct family member or therapist. I don't see how he ever will. He will never kiss a girl, drive a car, or have a job. I have no idea if he wants to do those things or not, or if he knows they exist as things at all. In the early days of his autism, we threw therapies at him by writing checks against the house and credit card to the tune of $30,000 a year for five years. Insurance has subsequently helped out some, but we're still digging our way out of that slowly but surely. Ultimately, however, they haven't really done much in the context of turning him into a person that can live his own life. For example, they are working on having him keep a Band-Aid on. They've had that as part of his program for about six months. And he'll keep a Band-Aid on for 15 minutes or so. Great. The reality is that when he gets a cut or laceration, it sits open for weeks. He simply will constantly tear away any bandages. I'm sure that he has good reasons in his mind for not wanting a Band-Aid on. He just doesn't understand the concept of medicine or making you feel better. Or in a few days, these things will go away. None of these things seem to get through to him. He's never been to the dentist. There are some that will work with children like him when he is unconscious. We just haven't felt like giving him anesthesia to take him to the dentist. But it's time, it's coming this year. He goes through periods of self-injury. When he was a toddler, he banged his head a lot. He broke a few windows in our home. He very likely concussed himself a few times. Lately, he's been punching the table during fa favorite scenes from Disney films. And he has bruises about three inches long on both hands. He understands when we tell him, don't do that, punch the pillow instead. He'll punch the pillow for a few minutes and then start banging the walls again. He's simply a slave to the routine. When my wife and I die, people that make $10 an hour will take care of him or not for the rest of his life. There's more, so much more, and the thing about autism is that it does not take <clears throat> one second off. Nobody gets a day off, ever. He works harder than anyone I know, harder than anyone reading this thread will ever work, and gets very, very little to show for it. He inhabits a world where everything is too loud, too bright, too confusing, and too unconforming to his patterns, and is trying as best he can to navigate through it. He didn't ask for any of this. <coughs> Sometimes he's got a father who gets mad at him who resents him for all these things and a million others that he cannot control. That's me. But he de deserves better than that. So I'm trying every hour of the day to remember that he is the one who got the raw deal, not me, not his brothers, him. I have bad moments, but no longer bad weeks or days. I'm working on it. If only I could work as hard as he does, 
I'd be golden. So the answer to the question <clears throat> that was asked is autism happened to him, not us. It, same kind of thing, I guess, is applies to dementia and people with Alzheimer's. They can't communicate, they, they don't receive in love and instructions that are being given to them. They're just in their own world. And yes, it's hard and frustrating for us to cope. The um, second story that I want to bring to you is <clears throat> about a, another little boy, Teddy. Jean Thompson stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school in the fall and told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her pupils and said that she loved them all the same, that she would treat them all alike, and that it was impossible because there in front of her, slumped in his seat on the third row, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed he didn't play well with the other children, that his clothes were unkempt and they constantly needed a bath. And Teddy was unpleasant. It got to the point during the first few months that she would actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen, making bold X's, and then marking F at the top of the paper. Teddy was a sullen little boy. No one else seemed to enjoy his company either. At the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's records, and she put Teddy's off until last. When she opened his file, she was in for a surprise. His first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright, inquisitive child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He is a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, Teddy continues to work hard, but his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest, and his home life will soon affect him if steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes sleeps in class. He is tardy and could become a problem. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem but Christmas was coming fast. It was all she could do with the school play and activities until the day before the holidays began and she was suddenly forced to focus on Teddy Stoddard. Her children brought her presents, all in beautiful ribbon and bright paper, except for Teddy's, which was clumsily wrapped in heavy brown paper of a scissored grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of cologne. She stifled the children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed behind just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell it just like my mother. After the children left, <clears throat> she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching, reading, writing, and speaking. Instead, she began to teach children. Jean Thompson paid particular attention to the one they called Teddy. As she worked with him, his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. On days there would be an important test, Miss Thompson would remember that cologne. By the end of the year, he'd become one of the smartest children in the class 
And well, he had also become the pet of the teacher who had once vowed to love all her children exactly the same. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that of all the teachers he'd had in elementary school, she was his favorite. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school, third in his class, and she was still his favorite teacher. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he'd stayed in school, had stuck with it, and would graduate from college with, with the highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still his favorite teacher. Then four more years passed, and another, yet another letter came. This time, he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still his favorite teacher, but now that his name was a little longer, the letter was signed Theodore Stoddard, MD. The story didn't end there. See, there was, another, <clears throat> there was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he'd met this girl and was to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in a pew usually reserved for the mother of the groom. And on that special day, Jean Thompson wore that bracelet, the one with the missing rhinestones. And on that special day, Jean Thompson smelled the way Teddy remembered his mother smelling on that last Christmas together. They hugged each other and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Mrs. Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. You never can tell what kind of impact you may make on another's life by your actions or lack of actions. Consider this fact in your venture through life. We're split up for our classes at this time. Will the teachers please stand? Tony, would you have prayer for us this morning, please?
Good morning. I want to welcome uh, each of you that are here today uh, with us at the Waynesboro Seventh-day Adventist Church in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania for our Sabbath school this morning. And I want to welcome especially those that are joining us online. Uh, we pray that uh, you'll be blessed as well. we study our lesson today, Jacob Dash Israel, a name change. Uh, this is going to be an interesting lesson. I mean, there's a lot of material here. It's, uh, it's going to be a challenge to see what we can do with this. But uh, dysfunctional family, uh, I think most of us, if we're honest, we can probably relate in different portions of this. Uh, we've all had our dysfunctional moments. And, uh, but uh, we also have the same God who can, can bring uh, order out of uh, disunity. And uh, so... Let's us begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, Lord, as we open your word, we pray, God, that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit. The same Spirit, Lord, that inspired these words, that uh, saved these stories that uh, we could learn from. Lord, we pray that as uh, we study these words, as we study these lessons, that the same Spirit would uh, instruct our hearts, instruct our minds, Lord, and help us to grasp the realities that uh, may be applicable to each of us and our families. Bless us now, Lord. Uh, lead us, we pray, in the most holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Um, our Sabbath school uh, memory lesson today is uh, from Genesis 32, verse 28. <coughs> says, And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Anybody here ever wrestle with God? How many? Anybody? I know I have. I didn't have to wrestle with him, I just believed him. <laughs> there you go. Just know that. That's good. For me, I was a little more hard headed. I always had to wrestle. I still am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's in the. Uh, yeah, it seems like I do a lot of wrestling throughout my life. This this lesson deals with uh, a change of name. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, we are, see ourselves one way, or we perceive our our life is in one way, but God sees things differently. Um, I know as a young boy, uh, this story was very interesting to me because I was, uh, I had dyslexia and stuff. Uh, they didn't know what it was back then, you know, it just ranks a slow student and a little troublesome. <laughs> and um, I had this teacher that uh, in elementary school who, uh, he noticed that I had this uh, knack for doing stuff with mechanical stuff. And so he, when we would have the videos or the, the films back then, the little 16 millimeter videos and stuff, it was my job to get the film all wound in there and get everything ready. And, and that was the beginning of me kind of feeling like, well, the school's not so bad. And, uh, you know, it, um, there are teachers like that in your life that make a difference. And uh, sometimes it's an aunt, sometimes it's a grandma, sometimes it's a, a, a neighbor that's that person. Maybe it's you or somebody that's sitting next to you or a friend of yours. So, uh, what I want to suggest is that let's try to learn to see through God's eyes. Because God sees the beginning from the end, doesn't he? You know, we're sometimes, uh, it's hard for us, like we're driving our car in the fog here. We can't see past, you know, we're just watch, following that line, trying to stay in our lane, you know, and try not to run into anything and, and God is on the other side of the fog and knows what's what's beyond the fog and in the fog 
And uh, we wonder, wow, I, I made it, didn't hit nothing. You know, it's like we're so proud of ourselves, but we don't realize that it was God that helped us to, to make that trip. Our lives are like that sometimes. And I think as we uh, see this lesson here of wrestling with God, <clears throat> our story starts off uh, that uh, Jacob has just uh, left uh, Laban, and he's on his way home now. God has instructed him, it's time for you to go home, back to your, your homeland. And he realizes there's a big obstacle ahead of him now. Yeah. yeah. I guess I'm thinking of uh, getting away from Laban, how he finally feels relieved. He's gotten out of that situation now, you know. He's got his family with him. And God has is, uh, made him wealthy. And all of a sudden, he's probably feeling good. I'm going to go home, you know, to my homeland. But oh, there's this huge obstacle there. I got a brother that wants to kill me. You know? <laughs> and then. And for good reason. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, I mean, it. He was done, done dirty, and uh, you know, I'm sure that years of festering, you know, he's thinking, boy, it's like I see him, he's going to tear me to shreds. And was was his brother a, a little wimpy guy? No. Now, he was like a mountain man, you know. He was yeah. quite a yeah. an outdoorsman. I mean, he was not, not somebody to be overlooked, especially if you come into a physical conflict. I mean, it's going to be a battle. So he, I think it was probably smart for him to be concerned about that. So have you ever had something that you had to do and it's like, maybe it's like going to the doctor, having a root canal or whatever it is. I don't know. Each of us has that thing. So I just, I don't want to do that. This one, this one really had Jacob worried, you know. And it's kind of a natural reaction, I think, even for us, is when something of that magnitude confronts us, we go straight to God, you know. But interesting how Jacob gets into this wrestling match with God. But how often do we, we don't wrestle. We kind of go to God, ask him, and expect him to just to remove this obstacle just like that. We don't spend enough time in this wrestling match, do we? You know, Tony, it, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned that because when he first uh, is arriving, I mean, I'm sure he's doing a math in his head. It's like, you know, I really ripped my brother off and I took his, and look at, he looked behind him and sees all the, the blessings that God has bestowed him with. He's got two wives, he's got children, and, and you know, he, it, the blessings are obvious. You can't hide it. And now he's gonna gotta face his brother who's was ultimately supposed to be the true recipient of, of that. And now I got some explaining to do. And he's trying to to figure out how do I smooth down the ruffle feathers, how do I calm the situation, how can I bring peace to something that I'm sure he was thinking that if they had done that to me, yeah, I would still be angry. I can only imagine how my brother must feel. Have you ever been like that? Just trying to, you think somebody's got it in for you and then you find out maybe it wasn't quite as the way you thought it was? Yeah. Maybe it was worse. Maybe you were hoping it would be better and you found it, it blew up in your face like, well, I didn't see that coming. So Jacob is, First thing he does is he, he sends a bunch of guys ahead with cattle and different gifts for his brother. He figures, well, yeah, I'm going I'm to kind of like little mini tsunamis of please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. And <laughs> it's like, you know that uh, Jacob or Israel now after his wrestle with God still carries a little bit of the same trait. Because what's he do? He's saying he divides his camp into two, doesn't he? So, <laughs> In reading this lesson and everything this week, I came to realize that they left out part of the story. Jacob didn't know, and when you read the story in the Bible, it tells about this, that the Lord came to Esau in a vision the night before and told him, you are not to do your brother harm. 
Because when you read it, read that, and you understand that Esau was bent on revenge before Absolutely, this yeah. incident. Yeah. And and too many times we we seem to have a tendency to not put enough faith and trust in the Lord to just step out and go forward. And we're trying to placate individuals to make to try to ease how we feel about the situation. We're right. trying to manipulate things. Exactly. Our skill. And so. Jacob, I mean, wasn't he trying to manipulate things all through his life? You know, whether it was goats and which goats have the spots or don't have the spots, he was always manipulating things. And he was trying to work, and then he got snookered himself, and you know, I, and that didn't sit well with him. You know, but he's like, well, I gotta, I gotta go with it because I, I, I want the, this wife. You know, so I've got to go along. He got, got over on I me, mean, but he was always working the angle. And, uh, it's a perfect example for us. Um, here, God knows that uh, Jacob's going to come to him. God knows this. God knows that Jacob's worried about this obstacle. And, and God doesn't tell Jacob what he's working behind the scenes. He goes to Esau. Would he not do that for us in our lives, in our obstacles, the things that are confronting us? And we pray and we start to wrestle with God. And we're like, but he doesn't hear me. He's not answering my prayer. And here God's already gone before us. Uh, Rich. That's the thing too is we have a tendency to keep God in a box. Mm -hmm. We don't think about the fact that He is sovereign, Lord of all, not yeah. just the good, Lord of the evil too, because He puts the boundaries. And when you look at the story of Job in the Bible, He told the devil, the devil said, Let me get, get a hold of my, I'll make him change his mind. And the Lord said, You can go this far and no further. And then He says, You can go this far and that's it. You can't go any further than this. So he puts parameters not just on the good of the creation, he puts it on the evil that's in this creation because of sin. Well, and I think you're touching on the theme of this entire quarter. Constantly, God is there to pick up our mistakes, our errors, our brokenness, our brokenness, and how he even, the, the things that are even evil from us, God is constantly there turning those back around, trying to work those back for good, trying to, you know, reverse that, you know. And we also see through these this this uh, course of lessons that everything does work out to God's purpose for what he wants. Look at uh, Genesis thirty two ten. It says, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. For with my staff I pass over the Jordan, and now I have uh, I have become two bands. So he's having this conversation with God, and, and he's acknowledging, you know, I've made a mess of things, and I, I don't have anything to come to you. You know, it's not like, Oh, I'm Jacob, you know, so you've got to listen to me. He's like, God, you see the mess I've got, and look at what you've done for me. You're my only hope. Have you ever been in that situation? God, I, you're my only hope. Yeah, I rack my wits, and I can't figure this out. It's like a Rubik's Cube, you know, I can't figure it out. <laughs> well, some of you might be able to do it. I've, I've never been successful at that. And so it's, I end up taking a hammer to them. <laughs> Peachy? You know, I think the whole bottom line is Jacob has forgotten, even though God had shown him and telling him that he was with him. But he was so lacking of that faith. Because if you look back on the story of Jacob and Esau, Esau has allowed Jacob to take his uh, firstborn blessing. He gave his uh, birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. And so, but he also, I believe he know that from his parents or grandparents, which is uh, Abraham, that God has told Abraham 
you're going to be have your descendants. It's as the stars. stars in the sky. So he should know all this time, but it's just like us. We know at the moment, but then something come up, we lack of faith. And then we start wallowing our own trouble and thinking, what am I supposed to do? You know, irregardless of what, I believe that is where his problem was, is that he wrestled. Even when he called upon God, I think that was because he was at the point where he said, you know, look at me. You know, I should know better, but I'm not. I'm struggling. So what do we, what do, we do with when God says, be holy as I am holy? When he says, you know, that... Uh, I will give you the the will and the desire to do my good pleasure. And then we look at our lives and what happened? It's the, these promises of God are sure, are they not? Yes. When God gives us command, does he not give us the, the wherewithal to bring it about? Yes. Well, you know, in my own real life, lately, just, you know, yesterday, I have to ask my question of myself. Am I that bad? Am I that rotten? That, you know, just like with a Jacob, despised by your own family? You know, you question that. But yet, with God, all things is possible. And he will finish whatever he started in you. So we, we come to this story now, and Jacob is He's divided his camp up. He's using a little strategy. He figures, well, if the first one gets wiped out, that there'll be a chance at least I can save part of my family. And you know, he's still working this math in his head. You know, it's like a like shooting billiards. He's working the angles. You know, if I get bounces here, it's going to go there. And he's trying to figure all this stuff out with human. And then he he, he takes care of everything he can do. And then he. Sorry. Trying to turn it off. <laughs> oh, I want you to finish your thoughts. Go ahead. Um, this was uh, this is a little uh, quote from Acts of the Apostles, and I thought it related to all of us and, and what to Pete what Pete was saying is because God is leading His children that trying experiences come to them, trials and obstacles are His chosen <coughs> of discipline, His appointed conditions of success. Success. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us to rejoice always. Uh, he who reads the hearts of men knows their weaknesses better than they themselves can know them. Absolutely. How well? I mean, how do we learn this human thing? It seems like if it's too easy, we don't really get it. Some of the smart ones they learn from other people's mistakes. Some, like me, we have to learn by making the mistakes. God uses some of these hard things on us. Yeah. So that we can get the lesson. Yeah. Uh, it's a little hard knocks. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, some of us, you know, are smart and we can see somebody else. It's like, oh, my big brother did that. It's like, man, I don't want to do that. Yeah, that didn't work out well. Fear is a deterrent. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we can learn from others' mistakes or we can learn from stories like this. That God gives us these stories so that we can learn. I mean, these aren't just fairy tale stories. These, these are stories that are meant to instruct us, to give us guidance. And because what does Psalmist say? There's nothing new under the sun, right? That families are families are families. I mean, it's the only thing that changes is the names and locations, but it's still human beings that are broken and, and bent, and then God's in a process of repainting and fixing all the dents and putting it back in factory spec. That's what I was going to say. In, in a way, it's, it's an encouragement as much as it is, you want to say a threat, it's not really a threat, it's an encouragement. If you're willing to do the work and overcome these things, then God is there for you. Amen. Yeah. So, so it's encouragement. I still see a little bit of uh, the old uh, Jacob there. Yeah. He comes out, he's getting ready to meet his brother here, and he divides into two camps. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he's uh, Jacob the deceiver anymore, but he's still a strategist, you know. Yeah. I'm going to divide my camp into two because of Casey. He waves out one, and I see that in myself, you know. I ask God to help me, but I still got to keep helping God a little bit, you know. 
And uh, but what does happen when Jacob meets his brother Esau? Well, that that's a remarkable thing. After he gets done wrestling with the angel, the angel of God, you know that 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 story and stuff. And I, I, I want to just back up a little bit, Tony, to that to that that story. He's you know. He's falling asleep, and all of a sudden, this hand grabs him in the darkness. Now, have you ever been startled like that? Somebody played a joke on you, or something jumped out of a broom closet, or something grabbed you? How? I mean, it just it like it, it startles you, right? I mean, you just completely scared out of your wits. Well, he's expecting. He's already got reports that his Esau is coming with his army, and these in in his mind, it's like man. This is not going to end well, you know. I, I hope that at least all these gifts I said has softened him a little bit, so maybe he won't kill me. He'll just beat me up a little bit and send me on my way. And I'm sure he's thinking all these things. Sure, sure. So all of a sudden, this this hand in the darkness, he's and he starts fighting for his life. And uh, the, you know, we read the story that uh, the the angel of God says. He goes, Dale, let me go. And he said, what does he do? He cries out, I won't let you go until you bless me. Because he realizes he's no longer wrestling against a man. He's wrestling against God. And what happens, this angel of God touches him on the hip and dislocates his hip. Now, is that the situation you want to be in when you're getting ready to, to meet your brother that you're already disabled? You would think, oh, this is not working out. This is not working out the way I had hoped. So he tells him, he says, I've changed your name. Your name is no longer Jacob. But is what? Israel. Israel. It's a change. There's a change in name. It's now supplanter. It's now changed to a, a, a name that represents that God is now in his life. And... Uh, now we, we cross the river, and he sees, he looks up and he sees Esau coming with his guys, and, and he's thinking, oh, this, is, this might not work out like I had planned. And what does Esau do? What does the story say? He comes and hugs him. And weeps on his shoulder. Does that remind you of another story? Joseph. You know that this this idea. See, these family things sometimes go through families that they repeat it over and over again. Yeah, and and we see the line. You know, it's my it's my sister. We we see these things, father and son, and grandfather. You know, we see these things repeated through families. And what God is in the process of doing is fixing those things. That we have to be a chain breaker. And God is asking Israel to step up and be that chain breaker. Somebody's got to step up. And so he steps forward and like I say, his brother Esau grabs him and, and sobs on his shoulder. Can you imagine the relief that he must have felt? Now the, the Bible doesn't mention it. The Ellen White talks a little bit about it. That... Uh, Esau must have been watching him and noticed that yeah. he's saying, wow. You know, he's, the, he's the, the younger brother, you know. I didn't expect <laughs> he's walking like an old man. And it must have taken him by surprise. My question is, is could Esau have been that far away from God for God to reach him through a dream? His heart I his think body. his heart had softened over the years. So he probably realized that, you know, I've, I'm as much to blame for this situation as it's anybody. Too far off, but well, it, and he even had, he so didn't even have any idea whether he would ever see his brother ever again. You know, and even if you're hard of heart and angry over something, that can have an impact on you. The, the fact that you may possibly never see that individual again. And you could have regret in your heart, and, you know, wish I could have done something different about it. So I think that's probably what Esau was going through in his mind over all those years and everything like that. And when the opportunity arose, God knew 
the intent of the heart and implemented a plan to reach the individual where they were so they were prepared for the meeting that was going to happen. But neither one of only Jacob knew that he was going back. Esau didn't know until he had heard, probably, he probably heard reports from, from, from other reports. countries. Like yeah. There's this huge group of people right. coming across the, the plane here. That, mm -hmm. your brother Jacob. Yeah, and it's like, it looks like your brother. And so I'm sure he was, yes, Carol? 20 years they were apart, so that gave him time to think. <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, I mean, you know, Esau was intent on killing him until God got through to him on this dream. I mean, it's just like like an overnight thing now. But two, it's, like it says in Proverbs, train up a child in the way that he should go, and he won't depart from it. Mm -hmm. sure. So Esau still had Abraham and Isaac, who were God-fearing <laughs> father and grandfather. So the seeds were there. Esau was not as tough as he thought he was. Right. And so, I mean, God, of course, stepped in. But I think those things may have played a role. I mean, it doesn't say. I but believe just, so. I believe that. Yeah. But I think... Good. 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 Yeah. Preston? We find in Genesis chapter 35... Uh, verse 29, when the Bible said that Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and right. Jacob yeah. buried him. Yeah. For us, maybe burying someone might not have the same connotation like in ancient times, but it was a very big issue big deal to be able to bury your father, your patriarch, the patriarch of the family, and, and to have both of them bury him, that, for me, I read more than just what we read on the surface of the Bible passage. Uh, somehow, they must, have found, they must have found at the end of their time and closer to the death of their father, Isaac, some more affinity. Mm -hmm. that when they came to the burial where they needed to grieve together yes. they needed to embrace one another and remember their childhood and their times now they were in a better position to move on with life yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree because back to what I, that kind of original thing I was asking I think God made such a strong impression on Esau and he wasn't that far from God that uh, it made him open his eyes and his heart to his brother Jacob and from that moment on, when they met, after Jacob come back, there was some real reconciliation taking place there. And that passage there that Frank just read that or you shared with us uh, really brings that out. You know that you know they come back, they get together, and it seems like to me, and I might be reading too much into it, but like you say, Pastor, there must have been some real reconciliation, and they was mm -hmm. coming together as brothers again. You know, to be able to bury their father. That uh, yeah. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. Uh, something in our life, you know, if we are out with a family member or a, even a coworker or somebody in our life, an acquaintance, but giving God the chance to work for us can bring about real reconciliation and peace and, and restore uh, that brotherly love. I mean, that, that gives me hope. Now, let me ask you a question. If I, if I go over to the car dealer and the car dealer rips me off, it really makes me angry, does that hurt as bad as my own brother or my own family does that to me? Which one Which one do you think cuts a little deeper? The family. The family. Now, how about in the church? If a brother gives you a sharp elbow, you know, it talks harshly to you. Does that, does that hurt just like family? So I, I want us to realize that if, if we have been wounded along the way in, in the church, that God can do this miracle for us as well. In the church, God wants to bring healing and reconciliation. He wants to bring healing to us. This is the purpose, is to restore Eden. You know, this whole planet is broken, including us. And God wants to, to reset everything back to the way it was intended to be. 
And so we see this, this relationship reset. And uh, I'm sure that as they talked, that Jacob must have taken a few deep breaths and said, thank you, God. He must have realized. And Esau was probably so glad that he could put down that heavy burden of anger and hatred and, and retribution. Can you imagine how long he's been carrying that to set, finally set that down? Yeah. Amen. I mean, that's heavy. I mean, we don't realize sometimes when we carry these, these things of anger around. I had some people who do some dirty deeds to me in the fire department. And I carried those anger for a long time, but I finally have been able to, to put them down. And um, I can't tell you how good it feels not to, to be carrying that. And uh, the same thing is true in the church, you know, that uh, we can carry these these ideas of anger or, you know, they, they really did me wrong and they owe me an apology. But God is working. God is working you. You may not see what God is up to, but God is working in all of our lives. If we'll let God in, he's knocking at the door and that's what he wants to do. He wants to come in and fix us. You know, maybe you're, what did he say, my fur is not heavy? Already, right, seriously? One thing that I see that in both brothers, I guess as far as we get into this, what I see the one thing that God asks us to do when we approach Him is to humble ourselves. And we see Jacob as he begins to wrestle, he had to humble himself. Uh, Esau, in a way, he's humbling himself when he meets his brother, Jacob, you know. This allows God to really work on our behalf when we humble ourselves. And also when we forgive, what is the Lord's Prayer? Remember that the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 says, let us forgive our debtors, or forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So forgiveness comes to us when we forgive others. So when we, when we, when we exercise forgiveness and overlook an insult, overlook a sharp elbow, then how many times have we given God the sharp, sharp elbow? Mm -hmm. How many times have we broken God's heart? He's forgiven us, and you know, when he when he had rode up that cross, he was thinking about you and I today. Amen. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Did any of us deserve it? So the Bible says, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. Bible is very clear. So this idea of forgiveness and, and reconciliation is part of what the atonement is about. It's a reconciliation of family. Are we not? Uh, Isaac is the prince of God. That's his name. Are we not princes and princesses? Who, whose throne are we going to sit on? Jesus says, I sit on my Father's throne, and you're, you're going to sit on my throne with me. Yeah. Have you thought about that? I was once God's enemy. I, I did some unspeakable things. And yet God has given me, he says, I'm going to have you sit on my throne with me. That's mind-blowing. Amen. That is mind-blowing. God is setting things right again. And so there's, there's hope for us. So this forgiveness is a big part. And we talk about Diana. Mm -hmm. What do we do with that? I mean, that's, there's so much dysfunction there. I mean, it's like you see a glimmer of hope and then this thing pops up. And there's always consequences when we try to help God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i got to sum it up to you, you know? Yeah. And there's something coming down the road. And yeah. We try to get, get ahead of God and do things ourselves. And that just seems to be the thread of this whole uh, of the book of Genesis, you know, as we go. We see man continuing to, uh, they're, they're following God, they're attempting to follow God. And this is, I see it in my life, I'm sure everyone else does too. But we try to follow God and then we, we try to get ahead, we get ahead of God, make mistakes, wrong turns. Richard? I think we should view it as God doesn't need us to accomplish his purpose. He wants to use us. 
but he can only use us when we're willing to be used by him. And when we make the choice to be used by him and completely submit ourselves to him, then we won't have those issues of trying to help God because we don't think he's doing it fast enough or the way we want it done. When we do that complete and total submission in, in a relationship with him, we don't get in his way. Then he can use us properly the way that he wants to do it and achieve the goal he's trying to get in the way he wants in the time he wants instead of trying to do it in our time frame. Remain humble. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to ask that lesson real quick because we're out of time. It talks about idolatry. Mm -hmm. And he was going to, to offer a sacrifice when he got to Bethel. And what did he tell his family? Gather up your earrings, all the, your jewelry, your idols, give them all to me. And he took and confiscated them and took them and hid them. He removed, he was removing the idolatry from his family so that he could approach God and make intercession for his family. Does that remind you of another story like Job? Just in case they've sinned, he was offering mm -hmm. intercession. Jesus is doing that for us right now. How does that make you feel about Jesus? That he is making intercession for us? That he's putting in a good word for us? Amen. Even though we feel like it's possible, I'm not, I might actually make it to heaven. Yeah. Even, though we've, Jesus been, in my even though we've been scoundrels and, and we've done yeah. things that are unsavory, Jesus is still making intercession for us. And so there is good news here. We're out of time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that could go on all day, really. I, I love to discuss, so pick up the word and just start having a discussion. Yeah. yeah. So, so tell me, why don't we close with prayer? I think it's so unless you have, you have a closing thought. I, I think I might. Does anyone else have a thought? Maybe they want to share it quickly before we close. Okay, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, again we thank you so much for the love that you have for us and how you work in our lives each day. Uh, let us not be impatient with you, Lord. Let us wait upon you. Let us come to you in, in awe and reverence and humble and meekness, Lord allow you to do God-sized things in our lives for us. Let us not be afraid of the obstacles and the things that make us afraid. Let us turn them over to you. And Lord, uh, again, we just thank you and praise you for being with us, for your word. And we ask that you would continue to go through with us on the Sabbath day. Uh, we're just anxious for all the blessings today, Lord, and throughout the week. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name.